All right, I'm going to go. I don't know if they do intros in this room. I'll just do both. Hi. Welcome to uh, SecurityCon, KubeCon. This is my first time ever talking at one of these. So I'm, what could go wrong, right? I got a lot of moving parts. I'm trying to warm this room up for probably better things to come. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, you say so. Uh, I have already learned that walking around on this stage may not be the safest thing I should do. Uh, this is Poning the CI, and I'll just dive straight to it. Uh, the story behind this, I was asked to research this because this happened to our open source project, Chekhov. We got a pull request one day from this guy, and I'm going to just highlight that because there's a little re return to that earlier because this, this talk gets more interesting as time goes on because weird stuff keeps happening to us. But you can see there's a name up there that says MYoung34. Just remember that. By the way, if MYoung34 is in this room, I'm sorry because uh, this is not going to reflect positively. So this is what the pull request was. It was delete everything useful in our build YAML and replace it with a PS and an env on our self-hosted runner. So obviously we didn't accept this PR, almost did, but that would have been bad because our self-hosted runner has all sorts of information on it, uh, both in terms of environment variables, seeing what processes are running, these are all bad things. So I was then, our CTO Brack said, can you just like d dive into this? How bad could it have been for us? So I did, and that's, this is kind of the result. The first thing, of course, was I had to break the news to him that generally running self-hosted runners on open source project is considered bad. Um, but of course, if you look out in the world and see how many people actually use self-hosted runners on public projects, all right, let's just forget what best practices are and just go with the actual reality of what's really happening. Uh, and I have a link down there. You don't have to take photos of links. At the very end, I have one, sh one slide that has every link that I use. So if you just want to go click and look around, then you can do that. This is the obligatory me slide where I inflate my ego. The uh, Cloud Native Security Advocate, I work for Bridge Crew. Bridge Crew is bought by Prisma Cloud, which is Palo Alto Networks. It's like, it's, I don't, I'm not sure who I work. I work for somebody. I've been running code since 19, <laughs> and doing a lot of security thingies. Uh, if you're ever in London, England, uh, ping me and come to our meetup. We run a meetup in London called DevSecOps London Gathering every month. Have a lot of wonderful guests on there. And if you ever want to kill an hour on a Friday around three, three o'clock, uh, there's a show on Twitch called C9K. It used to be called something quite profane. Turns out YouTube doesn't like that. So we had to change the name. And there's a perfectly innocent QR code. Go ahead and scan that. So GitHub Action Workflows. Hands up if you use GitHub Action Workflows. Great. Uh, so I can speed through this. So I, I do a lot of grabbing the, the actual text from GitHub because their own help, I found, kind of takes you down the wrong path sometimes. Uh, but this is just what it says. It says you can create workflows to do three things. Build your application, deploy your application, or do just stop, like add a label to an issue. Uh, you can sanitize an issue, etc. And I'm going to be doing some of these things live, so if it all blows up in my face, that's what it's going to do today. The fundamental problem generally is that if you submit a pull request like this person tried to do that is in the GitHub workflows path, it will try and execute the workflow. It doesn't know the difference between a pre-existing workflow and one that you're sending in as the commit, which is weird. The other thing is that a lot of the uh, creation of workflows is generally done by people who aren't AppSec professionals and they don't quite have the mentality of sanitizing your inputs yet. So you've got things like issue name, issue description. The list of potential inputs is actually pretty big, in particular if you use things like workflow run triggers where you're feeding one workflow into another, then it really complicates what is considered input or user controlled input. So a lot of people aren't doing that. And there's a lot of things that can happen as a result of that. And the last one, of course, that workflow directory it doesn't have special permissions. You can add permissions to it, but by default, uh, anything, anybody can submit anything to it. So that's not great. So as a result of that, there's a few things that can happen across all of these. So if you're not sanitizing inputs, you can do some kind of command injection into there. If I know that you're using something to build or even deploy, then I'm assuming that you might have some access to credentials on your self-hosted runner. So what can I do to try and achieve acquiring those credentials and execute some form of supply chain attack. So this is, this is what I was challenged with. What I found kind of confusing down to the box is 
some of the reactions GitHub has when you are a new contributor. Like the first one up there, let's just do this. This is exactly what happened to us. And actually, if we uh, go here, you can see I've got two people here. I've got this a malicious person called Loud Canadian. And then I have this nice person over here called Eurogig, who's just trying to maintain this wonderful application. And I've submitted a pull request, and sure enough, I have my approve and run. And this is what happened. We just didn't click this. Which actually, I am going to click now, because I don't mind, just to kind of push things along. I'm going to merge this pull request. I'm going to confirm the merge. Fabulous. Awesome. So, so now this person is a wonderful contributor. So what happens in GitHub is you don't get these instructions on the top. You notice they weren't there. This is from the help. And that does warn you that if the contribution is in the GitHub workflows directory, be alert. Fantastic. What could go wrong? If you have no workflows whatsoever, it kind of scolds you and says, hey, why don't you have workflows? Come on, man. You could, you could use this to catch bugs and enforce style. Workflows are a good thing for security. Okay. The default for outside collaborators is that you only require approval for the first thing you do which I just did. Once you've done that, you're an insider. Awesome. So it's far easier to become a malicious insider just by changing a readme or going to the good first issues and doing something really simple. And then you've bypassed this whole workflow conundrum. Sounds a little too good to be true. So I have just submitted something. Here's the first thing I'm going to play with now, which is unsanitized inputs to workflows. Here's an, and this is me looking around for how do people do this in the, in the real world. So I look, just look for GitHub event issue title. I found this one, which was pretty cool. Somebody's creating, generating blog pages based on issues that are submitted. That's kind of neat. So what if I create an issue with a title that has a bunch of HTML in it that might fish for information when someone goes to that blog page? There isn't any real auto sanitization of what the issue title can be. That's kind of up to us. The other more common one, and this was like, there were thousands of these, just people logging issues or PR titles or anything that's like an input, user controlled input as they were arriving so that there's more visibility. Again, sounds like a good thing. The one I just submitted uh, a moment ago here, we can take a look at the files changed, is that one. That is designed to look like a positive contribution. I'm checking the input GitHub event issue title to make sure it formats to a certain way. And I look like I'm contributing to the project in a positive way, which is great. And that's it there. It's great unless if I create an issue and you probably would think surely GitHub won't let you create an issue with this weird title, surely, right? there would be something that would stop that from happening. So this is where you get to see all the little funny things that I've got going on here. So this is the, this is the good area. I've already merged this pull request. I go to my code. I've got workflows here and I've got my issue check, which is cool. It means anytime an issue is opened, it should run this. It should live in my actions world. So what happens? I go to my issues. So here's my bad ear. I'd, I'd probably get my friend to do this for me because I wouldn't want to do it myself, right? That would be too obvious. I'm a hacker. And I'm going to go to my ridiculously tiny notes here. I'm going to grab exactly what that said. I'm going to use a back tick. Everybody knows what a back tick does? Fabulous. Because the even if I see equals or I assign the value or do anything and I get a workflow, it happens on a bash script. Bash script, bash script seeds a backtick and it's like CloudFormation sees a dollar squiggle. It tries to resolve the meaning of it before it does the assignment. So I hadn't really screwed this up. If I, if I create this issue, issue, seemed happy with it. And I go there and look, it, it's, Ooh, hello. 
And I'll go back to my webhook site. And so I now I have all the environment variables from that particular runner. By the way, if you never use webhook.site, it's awesome just for testing things. It's also good for messing with people. But it was kind of that easy. So that was like the first thing ever it was like, all right. So any of these sites that are doing any kind of input sanitization, I can now just vacuum out all of their environment variables in a much easier way than what was attempted on us. So that was interesting thing number one. But there's ways to protect yourself from this. Like there are environmental protection rules and environmental secret rules that already exist. There's a link down the bottom. So if suddenly you're watching that and you're going, oh, maybe I should only give certain workflows, certain access to certain environment variables and secrets, you should. The link will be at the end. It looks as simple as environment, name the environment, et cetera. So it's really, really simple things to implement. Generally, I found that you should nearly never have like hard-coded credentials, even if you think they're stored as secrets. You'll find out later why about that, but it's not a good thing. Short-lived tokens are important. If you use self-hosted runners, it can be an advantage because you can create lists that and sh and sh make sure that your only certain IPs can talk to certain IPs. So self-hosted runners can be an advantage. So, um, in AWS, reporting is important. OpenID Connect, uh, GitHub Actions does use OIDC. It doesn't use 50 Spire, unfortunately, yet. But if you can make sure you use that to access any kind of cloud provider, definitely do that. Instructions specific for Amazon are down there and also just generic ones for github.com. So when this happened, it was really fascinating because our own repo wasn't as secure as we really thought it should be. Number two. I'm not going to show this one, but I just find it fascinating. Oh, maybe I will show it later. So this brought me to branch protection rules. You should always have your branch protection turned on. What was amazing about when Checkoff first started, we were a startup and we didn't know how popular it was going to get. So it must have had a thousand stars before we had branch protection turned on. It seems crazy, but we were, and we were inviting collaborators like anybody help, help. And that, when that turns into a SaaS solution, you become a startup and you're like, maybe we got to go back to the original effort that we kind of quickly uh, sped ahead on. If you turn on branch protection, you should almost have everything ticked. Nobody ever does. If you do tick by default, the first thing require a pull request for merging, which you should, you require approvals, which you should. A lot of people think they're done, uh, but the default down there of one is kind of where it gets a little dicey because you can approve yourself. So over here, this changed in April this year, this year, the default, this is what you should have for workflow permissions. This is the, the good thing. Read repository contents permission in a workflow. This is what the GitHub token should be able to do. That's not the default though. The default is that there was about a day or a week or something where the default was the correct default for new repos. And everybody freaked out because they weren't expecting that to be the default. And so they went back to that. So just to know that's there. So if you create a new repo, the GitHub token, if you will have a way more access than you think, it's the difference between these, that middle column that says read only and that column there, which you probably is as far from least privileged as you can imagine. So I hope it's not too small. I'll show it again later, but to do a curl within a workflow, I was surprised to see, and by the way, if anybody from cyber security is here, this is their research, not mine. Um, you have everything you need to do a curl command. You've got the GitHub repository, you've got the GitHub event number, which is the pull request. You've got the secret GitHub token. Like you can just assemble a command. You can't approve a pull request. So you can't merge a pull request, but you can certainly do that and you can approve your own thing. And so that whole thing you did to have approvals is suddenly irrelevant. That's not all you can do. There's a lot of things. This is just to get your imagination going. All right. So the last one, fingers crossed it works. This is the one that I tried to submit because I thought this is the, how bad could it be section? So zooming in on there, I thought, all right, so I can get the environment variables. How can I get the secrets? Well, I got get the secrets in two lines by doing echo secrets to a file because the secrets are only available in the workflow. They're not environment variables, but unless I push them out to a file and then curl that out to the same bad URL, in which case now I have all the secrets, they're not encrypted. They're just there. And then I want the GitHub token. I'm like, well, how long can I, the GitHub token be alive for? Well, the GitHub token dies the moment the job dies. 
So I stick a sleep in there, and I get a GitHub token as well, and the secrets and the environment variables. Cool. And then I was kind of feeling nasty, so I did this version, which I thought, all right, well, what if I could do a reverse shell and then send that out to myself, and then that would make everything persist for as long as I wanted. So I thought, yeah, I'll do that one. So let's do that one. So there's a few things. I still have this sitting here. I still have this, which is cool. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to make myself a contributor. I'm going to do the, all the things you shouldn't do. This is a bad example of how to be secure. I'm going to do a collaborator. I'm going to add me so I can commit direct. I've been such a good person in this project that there's no reason why I wouldn't add myself. I just got an email telling me I'm added. Also, add to main, I'm going to turn this on. There we go. Now, I should have a lot of this stuff turned on, but I don't know why anybody would turn on a do not allow bypassing. Why is that even there? There's some weird stuff in uh, branch protection. Nice. So I'm all set up there. I've got code. I've got this running. And oh, yeah. I've got that running. Okay, it seems like it should work. I've got everything going. I'm going to go to code and my workflows. And so now I'm not in my own fork anymore. I'm actually right here. I'm going to add this file, create a new file. I, if you're ever going to add something dodgy, don't call it pwn.yaml. That's, that's a dead giveaway. That's a little tip for you budding hackers out there. There is my file. Now, the difference between this one and the one I just showed you is this actually has the auto approve in it as well, just for kicks up here. And that's, you probably need a telescope to read that, but here we go. Okay. So I have my little auto approve in there, which should, in theory, work. I should be able to propose this new file, which is fine. I'm going to create a pull request. To merge back. I need to fix able to merge. I know I can't read it. I know my class is on. Oh, one second, one second. I... Oh, Canadian patch one. Hold on. Sorry about this. I'm a little... Actions. Ah, there we go. So I have my GitHub token now. That worked. And I have a reverse shell, which is not ideal. And given the amount of time we have, now this is unlikely to work because I got my naming wrong, but there is another step here where because of the path. I'll leave it up there. There's, there's a step there where I can start to change what I, what I just did via the runner. Thus, I can cancel the pull request, delete what I've submitted, and change the actual person who did it because I, d I used an unsigned commit. And so I, I so it's, it's the things I can do well here are actually pretty terrible. Um, and I realize I'm a little short on time because, by the way, this is normally a 50 minute talk. <laughs> the other thing I noticed on most runners is that Docker is always installed by default. 
So while I got access to the runner as the ID runner, you can use Docker just to create an auto pop-out shell and upgrade yourself to root. So now I'm root on the runner as well. I'm kind of there as long as I want. Unless, of course, I use that Falco. Anybody see the Falco talk? I thought that was brill. So they should create rules to stop people from doing stuff like this. So that's kind of like the idea behind why this is all bad. The idea of getting a, being able to run things in shells is one thing, but to be able to destroy evidence of, and to be able to have full access to the repository that I just took over, make changes to pretty much anything in the code, change to adjacent code if it's a shared self-hosted runner, and even turn off the pull request remotely so that I can stay on the self-hosted runner independent of GitHub now. So what can you do with this? If you're, in, if you're taking part in the CTF, pretty much all the things that you would want to do in the CTF, I can start looking for AWS information that might be stored as environment variables. I can change the logging level on the runner that I'm on right now. I could get it to report back to me. I can, I can add my own SSH token so I can come back directly to the runner with all of this FAF. I can look at the processes, the network. I can look for access to S3 buckets. There's so much I can do. Now, the next thing I want to say is important information. I'm saying don't be a biff. You recognize this from uh, Back to the Future? Don't be a biff with this information. The thing that started all this, this is what changed a month ago. This crossed my path in my mass network of information that comes to me via newsletters and whatever. This came in and I was like, oh, Zucker Plans, abusing stuff was getting run into Facebook. That's what my talk's about. That's pretty cool. I'm going to read this. And I, was, I, did, I hadn't even scrolled down yet, and I went, M. Young. That's interesting. That's the guy. And I looked at what was happening here. He says Facebook. Actually, it was PyTorch, which is Facebook, which is now Linux Foundation. And he goes through all of his, he's kind of bragging about everything that he did all the way through. And really, it turned out all he was was after money. He's calling it a bug bounty. There was no bug bounty, but he just went through and was like using this thing. And then I realized we were part of the whole scattergun approach to trying to find people who had misconfigured GitHub or insecurely considered GitHub. And I'm like, you could have really messed with us like if we'd clicked that. That would have been really bad for our own, because checkoff is what powers our, our commercial solution, and that would have been not cool. And so... My little comment on that is that I don't think it's pretty, like, I love bug, bug bounties. I think they're a great idea. They make us more secure. But if you know how to do things like this, don't do it on open source projects that are a gift to the world, like PyTorch. Um, do it on actual bug bounties. It, it, that just, I just thought the behavior was terrible. The good thing about his article is that because he was actually doing this to real people, he got observations that I couldn't get. He did find out that many self-hosted runners did have access to S3 buckets. He did find out that many had access to ECR without ECR as immutable tagging, so he could change the images while maintaining the tag. Thus, supply chain attack. A lot of self-hosted runners were internal and were not on a VPC. So the efforts, I, I don't like what he did, but I like the conclusions that he got, so I added it to my presentation. All right, ounce of prevention. Oh, I'm just going to blast through these because I've got five minutes. Be careful when adding contributors. Even if you're a new startup, it's bad because people like me might be added to your... I mean, I'm just a terrible programmer, so that's bad either way. Self-hosted runners and public re repositories are being targeted. I mean, uh, branch protection is important, more than one reviewer, but there's lots of things inside branch protection. You really should read every single one and make sure you understand what they are. Um, don't run workflows unless you're 100% sure. Environmental protection... Um, short lifespan tokens of any kind, but preferably OpenID Connect if you're connecting to the cloud. GitHub event logging and code owners. Code owners is the thing I mentioned where you can add a code owners file, put someone's ID in it, add it to your GitHub directory, and then that's the person that can review. It doesn't end up just being any old person or yourself by a curl. And then the last one, which I didn't show you and I'm so sorry, but I'm, it, I'm running out of time. Sign commits that there was a bit in that script that just had me setting my git config to an email address, and it was Linus Torvald's email address. If you do that, try it on your own repository, set it up as yourself, use his email address, and do a commit. 
GitHub goes and finds his avatar and will pop it in as the author of the commit. You can be anybody you want with Git unless you're not. So you don't have to be you. It's way too easy to be somebody else in this world. Awesome tools you should be using if you're not already. OpenSSF scorecard, anybody using that? Yes, it rocks. Uh, it'll check so many of the things that I just talked about, branch protection, contributors from at least two different organizations, which I thought was funny because I did that in order to become a bad contributor. But I really like the avoid dangerous coding patterns. I did a lot of playing with that to see what it would find, and it was actually pretty good. Um, declare GitHub, I mean, that's not everything it does. It does awesome, all sorts of awesome things, just checking the security of the repository and the way it is tested in general. That's a definite use it. The other one I would be remiss if I didn't plug the own project I work on, but the reason we did this was to add rules to check off that look for the sort of same sort of things. So we've got strange patterns that look for uses of curl inside a workflow, anything that's doing what I did with secrets all the different possible reverse shell things, like anything at all like that is in there. And plus we have some, of the, we have some overlap with the OpenSSF um, as well, because we do scan the APIs and we look at branch protection being enabled and a lot of similar things like that. So there's a bit of a Venn diagram there, but using both certainly would get you a long way to stopping me doing anything like I just did there. And that is the end. And these are all the links I used. So if you're curious to read, you can go for it. Question. Yes. Uh, there'll be eventually a GitLab edition of this. Bitbucket did not, but I hated Bitbucket. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Uh, that's the end. Any other questions? I have three minutes. That's a, you have a three minute sign. That's an odd number to choose. Cool, all star. Everybody get that? It's like open SSF, but like huge. Same. Yeah, same. Oh, it makes sense. Awesome. Thanks for watching that. If that's it, great. Oh, well, again. I mean, thank you for asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. I'm looking at it. Uh, ask me next year when I do the GitLab version. <laughs> cool. Thumbs up. All right. Thanks.